So this is an interactive presentation, so I need everyone to take out their phone. And you'll see up here, I've got a URL for you to go to on your phone. You're going to install an app called Bright ID. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why Bright ID. So I was thinking a while back, I had this crazy idea that I wanted to buy a piece of land. It didn't really matter what kind of land. It could have been bare land. It could have been commercial land. And I wanted to open it up to anybody to decide how to use that piece of land. And then I wanted to see after that d if, we, if there was rewards or maybe rental income, if I could distribute that back to everybody who was participating. And I ran into, before I got anywhere near that, there were two problems. The first, and it actually boils down to really the same problem. But the first problem was with the voting. So how do, how do I have a vote where I make sure that each person can only vote one time? And then the second problem was with distributing the rewards. How do I distribute rewards in such a way that everyone gets an equal share? And it really is, like I said, the same problem. And I'll call it the one account per user problem. There are people who would like to distribute large amounts of currency, could be an existing currency, could be a brand new currency, and they'd like to get that out to as many people as they can in a way that's as fair as possible. You can think of universal basic income, but how do you, how do, you do that in, in a fair way? How do you solve this problem, this one account per user problem? Aragon is really good with token voting. You can do a lot of cool things with voting with tokens, but what if you wanted to do a per person vote? How do you do that? With Bright ID, you could have, with a Bright ID enabled Aragon DAO, you could have a per person vote. So let's talk about um, what Bright ID is and what it isn't. Um, Bright ID is an identity network, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but let's think about what we're already familiar with. So I have a social security number that I got from the United States government, and sometimes I use it online, which is really stupid, because a couple of years ago, uh, Equifax had a data breach where 50% of all United States social security numbers were leaked to attackers. We should have 50% of Americans should have replaced their social security numbers, but of course we didn't because that's really difficult to do that. With Bright ID, to replace your Bright ID, all you do is reconnect to a few friends. Uh, if you think about it, we all, as, as human beings, we come into this world with the ability to say, yes, I exist, I am a real person, but somehow we've decided that it's okay that we give that up to a national government and abdicate that right to them. So I'm thinking with, I think with Bright ID, you can take just the people that make the most sense to verify you as a unique person are the people that are enabled to do that. And those are the people that you already know. It's not some abstract government. It's not some big corporation that you're sharing your data with. You're making connections in an identity network. On the face of it, it feels a little bit like Facebook, but it's completely not the same. I don't want anyone to go away thinking like that, oh, I don't need Bright ID, I already have Facebook. Not the same, totally different use case. Every time you make a connection or join a group in Bright ID, it's for the sole purpose of either helping someone else to be verified as a unique individual or verifying yourself as a unique individual. So let's get into actually what this looks like. And you can follow along on your phone if you want. But when you first install Bright ID, you get to this onboarding screen. And um, as soon as you uh, are ready to get past that, you can just click on the Get Started. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to add a photo. You could have someone take a picture of you. You could do a selfie. You could choose from your library. I'm going to choose from my library. I've got a bunch of photos that I already took, so I'll just pick one. And then I'm going to go and add my name. I like to use my full name because I like people to know who they're dealing with. 
And so after I've entered my full name, then I just create my bright ID. From here, you can see that I don't, my score's pretty bad, it's zero. And so what do I do to get that up? That, the score is actually really important to applications. That's what they use to, to determine whether or not you're a unique person in this network. So we've got to try to, it, it runs on a scale from zero to 99.99. So we want to get that up. And to do that, I've got to join groups. And to get groups, I've got to make connections. So like, if you look at my connections, no connections. If you look at my groups, no groups. So I need to start making connections. So if I hit new connection, then it makes a QR code. And this is a one-time use QR code. So if I go back to the home screen again and I hit new connection again, it's going to be a different QR code this time. Um, and another way to make a connection is to scan someone else. So if I scan someone else's QR code, that will make a connection. So I see some people already doing it, which is pretty awesome. So I've got some friends here. This is Elsa. I scanned her, make a connection. I'm going to go to my next friend and scan them and make another connection. This is Sona. Yes, I confirm that. Um, scan someone else, my friend Joe. I'll make a connection with him. So I'm building up my connections. This is really cool. So I'm already up to three connections. That's a good start. My score is still zero, though. I, if I look at my connections, though, I can see that they actually have way better scores than me. So what's up with that? Um, it's because they've already joined a group. And if I look at groups, I can see that they have this group that has this nice score. And now I can actually join it because I know them. And so if you know enough people in group, you can join that group. And then if I look at the group, I can see that these, I just know those three people in the group right now. But that's, that was enough to join the group. If you know 50% or more, you can join the group. You can also create a new group and you would just have to select two co-founders to join to create that group with you and now I've got a new group I'm just waiting on them to join that group and then I'll have an another group so the cool thing about all that is now that I have a group now I'm gonna get a score so if I go back to the home screen now I have a score and my score came from that group so the way it works is you your score is the same as the the highest score of your best scoring group and so making groups is crucial to Bright ID. It's not just like some cool social thing. It actually serves a purpose. It helps with the graph um, uh, behind the scenes that's used to determine whether people are real people or not. What's happening behind the scenes is that um, each of these groups is connected in some way based on how the users in the groups are connecting to each other. And so um, you have this graph of groups that's connected. And the system is trying to determine if your group is, belongs to the, to the real, the main graph that, that, uh, that has real people in it. And so if you were to um, have a group over here that's not really well connected to the main graph of, of groups, then it wouldn't have a very good score. But that could, that could mean two different things. It could either mean that your group is filled with fake people, or it could mean, in which case it should have a low score, or it could be just that you need to do some more work with connecting, and, and, and at that point, you'd be able to bring up your score and be a part of the main graph. So there's, there's actually a lot more to it, but, but I'm not going to be able to have time to get, get into all of that. But um, what is, like, what can you do with Bright ID. That's important to talk about. So right now, you can't do anything with it except try to, it's kind of like a, a meta game where you try to, you can try to get up your score if, if that's interesting to you, or I don't know, see how many connections you can get, but there's not really anything you can do with it right now. So what's in the future for Bright ID? That's, that's important. So at the bottom, um, there's apps, which will do absolutely nothing if you press on that, but in the future, uh, there will be an in-app DAP browser for Bright ID. And so the cool thing about Bright ID is with each new app or DAP that joins the ecosystem, it's bringing in new users, and those users serve to strengthen the graph and make it easier for, every, for anyone else to be verified as a unique user. So for instance, if you're using Bright ID to uh, a Bright ID enabled Aragon DAO, 
by doing that, you might be helping someone else to be able to get verified to receive their universal basic income from a universal basic income DAP. So this is kind of the vision of Bright ID and what we want to do with it. And uh, yeah, it's really exciting what's coming up in the, in the next year. But um, there's one more thing that I need you to do, and that's to go back to... Go back to that uh, page that you were just on and go down to the bottom and you'll see a Telegram group and a Matrix group. Join one of those S because when you start using Bright ID, we want you to be part of our community so, and just give us feedback. And I didn't get to go very deep, so if you have questions, you can look for someone in an orange shirt. That would be either me or Philip, and we can talk to you about any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Hey guys, hello. So I'm Griff Green and this is Max. We're actually not, we weren't supposed to present today, but right now uh, the passport issuance of the United States is very centralized mm -hmm. and uh, the government shutdown actually prevented James from coming. So one day, uh, you know, the issuance of passports will be controlled by uh, Argonne Dow and we won't have these problems, but you mm -hmm. know, we just have to take our time. So, but we're here to present Tenograph Tenograph is a very important project for the space. Uh, as we've seen, consensus is sometimes hard in Ethereum and, and in blockchains in general. Uh, Bitcoin has an amazing co tool called Coin.Dance, where you can go and see the different uh, signals that people, influential people and, and organizations are saying about new Bitcoin network upgrades. In Ethereum, we don't have that. Well, actually, now we do, because uh, we have Tenograph. Tenograph was born out of uh, EIP-0 and the uh, uh, ETH magicians here in Berlin. Uh, this, was a, a dis this was decided to be a huge need in the space, and we've seen it come up continuously around ProgPAL, right? Like, who supports this issue? Who's, who doesn't support this issue? Obviously, during the DAO hard fork, lots of ideas came up about how we can, like, see what do people really think about doing this, network, this hard fork. And we were able to get signals from coin holders, but that's just one stakeholder group in a very diverse ecosystem. There's core devs, there's, uh, there's other token holders, there's, uh, there's miners, there's, there's regular app, uh, DAP developers and DAP users. And there's lots of ways to measure these uh, stakeholder groups. And so the goal of Tenograph is to give them uh, a way to signal what they believe and to aggregate those signals so that we as users of these platforms can go to one place and actually understand what is the state of the network? What do people think about you know, dropping the mining rewards from three to two? Is, you know, should we delay this hard fork? And if everyone could go to one place and understand that, we can, have, um, we can uh, come to consensus much easier as an organization. But I, of course, just see the problem and know we need the solution. I can't do anything about it. That's why we have Max to actually tell, talk about the solution. Thanks, Griff. So we've uh, looked into a bunch of uh, signals we can measure, uh, starting from like hash power and full node voting. Uh, like we already have interest uh, stances on the Twitter and Reddit, we already have it, but it's hard to measure and collect. So we try to think of the ways how we can ease up the work for the core developers, you know, in this measurement of the community sentiment. And uh, like on their own, each of uh, these signals has its own downsides. So for example, like identity-based voting is something we used for, but we don't have uh, such a widespread uh, like, uh, tool to do that or uh, we, can, we don't want to fall into plutocracy if we do only the coin uh, voting. So what we decided to do is to uh, select uh, several representations. So those three signals is what we used for the first version and kind of try to compare them, put them on the one graph and uh, so it can represent better what different types of stakeholder think. So this is how it looks like. First of all, we created a parser for the uh, EEP, uh, Ethereum GitHub, and we continuously like parse new EPs and uh, make a like interface for sorting and searching and grouping of them. Uh, then, uh, what what initially what the first like uh, thing that is worth making is of course a stake with voting, and we uh, allowed uh, like anybody to start basically a coin voting if they feel so, and uh, you have several. Uh, 
options to choose, either yay or nay or abstain. But where it really uh, comes the interesting part is the gas voting. So uh, by uh, voting by your address, you don't only transmit the number of tokens you had at the start of the voting. So we preserve the like this uh, like different playouts with uh, you know transfers. So we only measure how much how much Ethereum you got at the at the start of the voting. But also if you're an engineer and if your uh, like address has lots of uh, gas spent, this gives additional. Um, Point of view on on your uh, like on your voting, so you can see here an example of uh, like different distributions by different types of uh, like voting for gas and coin votings, and also some uh, experimental part we're playing with uh, is the uh, influencer stances. So um, we know that there are already some you know tweets that kind of support each specific EAP or not. And what we're trying to do is to kind of put them on the graph and connect it with the influencer like uh, ranking stats. So there's this uh, service called Hive One, which uh, allowed us to kind of understand who's the, the most influential people on Twitter in the Ethereum community specifically. And uh, that allow us, allowed us to do this. Uh, if you see graph on the top, you can see like how the yes or nay distribute over this uh, different um, like tops to tops to bottom of influences, and anybody can add a stance. Currently, it's done uh, like semi uh, semi automatic, but in the future we would kind of would, would like to see something where uh, you can hashtag some EAP and it will co automatically come to this system. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, we also want to uh, see real experiments. So it's already. Uh, live on Rinkeby, and we want to uh, like people to start their own votings, uh, not maybe only on peace, but on other questions as well. Uh, we want to see uh, additional points, additional uh, ways of voting, for example, hash power voting, and also we always wanted to make it more usable uh, for the users. Uh, so I really want to thank Grief for kickstarting this project overall and gathering our team and Argon, Nest, and Givet for providing the funding for this. We're working on this from the uh, summer last year and uh, put many hours in that. And uh, thank you. You can uh, see the version on the tenagraph.com. Thank you. Hello, thank you. How many of you don't know what a design system is? Don't know? A few? How many people were here for Yoni's uh, presentation on LoriKit yesterday? The majority, but not everybody. So for those that don't know what a design system is, let me tell you a little story. So once upon a time, there was the awesomeness. The, f the web was filled with colors and experimentation. There were menus and buttons all over the place. And websites and applications, or maybe not yet applications, were painful to watch and, uh, and uh, experience. Until this man came, Jakob Nielsen, who brought back uh, decades-old uh, techniques uh, and good practices about how to arrange the visual field and uh, uh, ease the cognitive burden on the user to make it more understandable and, and, and usable. He brought order into chaos. So what we are doing with the Web3 design system is exactly this, but for uh, Web3, for our time. Uh, so the Web3 design system has uh, three it has two main parts. Uh, one is a series of guidelines uh, of best practices that can help you as a developer decide very quickly what is best, uh, uh, the best experience for the user. And the other is a set of components like the LoriKid uh, uh, design system that you saw that will allow you to very easily and quickly implement prototypes and applications that do implement these best uh, practices for the UX. 
And uh, there is three main parts or objectives uh, to this process that we are doing. So right now, we are researching and creating these best practices, interviewing all the people in the space. We will talk about that. And these uh, tools, uh, uh, the objective of these tools is to give consistent UX to the users so that if they come onto Aragon or they go onto another DAB, they see the same pattern, that it's uh, familiar. They start to become familiar with the mechanics of Web3. And the other thing is that uh, we want to create these components in that need to be customizable. You as developers need to be able to use it not only for quickly building prototypes, Types, but also uh, implementing in, uh, in, in real dApps. It means that you will need to be able to, uh, to brand it to with your dApp, with your styling, etc., and adapt it to whichever chain is underneath. And it all started with a Web3 design principles, this uh, long list uh, of uh, ideas and principles and some components. It hinted at some of the components that you could have that I wrote uh, one year ago. But right now, we are doing this much more thorough uh, research. We've interviewed all the people in the space, or mo many people in the space, uh, who have users or dApps in production, uh, people that have talked to users uh, that are front-end developers or designers or product people, anybody who had experience of users. There aren't many in the space yet. Uh, we talked to them and tried to extract and gather all this information together. And so today, we don't have any components yet. We are finishing the phase of the research, but we have the second best thing that we can share with you today, which is a mental framework about how to think about Web3 problems, uh, putting order into the chaos that uh, today exists in uh, Web3. And so what we did is we asked these people, the interview people, what are the problems or the questions users have in the space? And some of these questions are fun, like how do I find these projects on the other internet? Or some, some are important questions, like why should I care about decentralization? And so we try to make sense and map them out and saw that there are two main categories of problems or questions users have. And these relate on one side to technicalities of the blockchain or the mechanics of how uh, the blockchain works, and others that relate to fundamental aspects of decentralization. And this Venn diagram, of course, you see there is overlaps and there's subcategories. We will see them. So we map them. We arrange these problems in these buckets. And, and so you have, for example, in the technical requirements, uh, how do I get ETH or what is gas, etc. And in the fundamental to decentralization is, can you reset my private key? This is an actual question users have, quite common actually, that speaks to the misunderstanding of what decentralization is about. And the subcategories uh, in this thing that we call the problem space, uh, there is a consensus that uh, there are new mental models. Like, for example, one of the biggest confusion users, users have is that data is not owned by one company, is not stored in a server, but it's shared. This is baffling to users. And also, there are new complicated concepts like transactions, gas, private keys. These are all unfamiliar to, to users. And not only they are new and complicated concepts, but we are also failing at explaining them today, at least. So by mapping the solutions that people found were usable in certain conditions, uh, we found also this that we call the solution space. It's another Venn diagram that basically boils down to two solutions that you can apply in your design decisions. One, you hide the technicalities if you can, or you explain it better. Let's see an example that makes it easy to understand. So gas, for example. We understood that all these problems are multidimensional. What does it mean? It's a fancy word to say that the questions or the problems fall in different buckets, in different categories of this diagram. Uh, so, for example, on the lower bottom, you see questions about what is gas, what is gas price, what is gas limit. And these, for example, you'd better hide them away. And some teams have had good results in hiding, uh, hiding away, that abs abstracting away that complexity from the user. Then there are questions about, uh, like, why does gas have different costs in different moments? This one Although you would want to hide it away, it will generate questions if people see different fees in different moments, <laughs> and they will start asking questions. <laughs> and, and so the only solution here is to explain it better. And on questions about 
who gets gas? Why do I have to pay the Ethereum Foundation? Users have this doubt that gas is going to either the DAP or the Ethereum Foundation speaks about their misunderstanding a bit of how it works, of course, but of decentralization in general. And in this case, you can only make a concerted effort to explain it better. And so the solution space also have operative choices that you can apply, which is on the lower uh, level, you can hide or abstract away complicated technical problems. We mentioned that and it's okay to have degrees of centralization, especially for novice users, but then, of course, you need to onboard them onto fully decentralized uh, the technology after. And uh, uh, on the explain better, you can use analogies on systems that users already know, like if it's a financial system, uh, go look at banking applications and bring out some of those patterns uh, from there. And in the fundamental from uh, problems of decentralization, today we are doing something wrong, which is we are trying to explain how something works. Well, we should explain the why. Start with the why, start with the benefits uh, of a and the advantages of a certain feature, not how it works. And so all these problems have sub-problems, sub-categories, etc. In gas, we mentioned, for example, there is this idea that uh, new patterns are emerging, like universal logins and meta transactions that allow to hide gas, for example. These are good patterns emerging for that. Mm, key management, other problems that are multi-dimensional, okay? There is problems uh, all over the, the space. And here as well, there is uh, the consensus that key management is one of the uh, main disruptors of the onboarding flow. If you are onboarding a user and you ask to stop and do something else, that it's okay to have this progressive security model, whereas you onboard them without asking them to back up the keys and then progressively, when it's needed, you do it later. And uh, Transactions, also a complicated concept. <laughs> Where is my money? What is nonce? I think we should overcome the idea of nonces and uh, not, uh, especially the sequentiality of transaction is something that is making confused uh, the users. The fact that you need to wait for one transaction before doing the other has caused some uh, uh, problems across uh, uh, many of the dApps that we've interviewed. And uh, uh, so in this case, for example, solutions that are coming, uh, there is this confusion about uh, the fact that transactions, wallets, and uh, blockchain, how they all relate together. And Yoni yesterday talked about some of the possible solutions, like, for example, to give human readability on transaction. There is RADSpec, this uh, standard that is proposed by uh, Aragon. Yoni mentioned it yesterday, that uh, when you click a button, it tells you what the function in a, is going to do in a human readable uh, way. And also to give a visibility on the state of the transaction, to show the history of those transactions. Again, yesterday Yoni showed the amazing new notification panel in Aragon. That is so good. Dabs think, hey, no, the wallet has the history of the transaction. I delegate it to them. No, Dabs need to take responsibility for that and have that interaction with their own users. And there's many other insights. I want to leave you with two. One is uh, mobile. Everybody thinks that mobile is the future, especially for onboarding uh, the mass adoption, for mass adoption, but everybody is designing uh, for desktop. And so it's very refreshing to see the announcement for Aragon Mobile that we heard from uh, Jorge yesterday. And this uh, idea that also it's um, the mobile is going to be the leading thing is uh, need to be uh, balanced out uh, that the blockchain has inherent risk and there are certain operations that are riskier that demand higher, uh, higher screen space. Like, for example, opening a MakerDAO CDP, probably opening a company or a DAO will require a higher, uh, a bigger screen. But yes, managing it or in the day-to-day -day interaction, you will want the mobile version. And last but not least, Designers need to be in the room from day zero. Uh, simple smart contracts create complicated interactions, so you should get a designer uh, in your uh, project since the beginning. Also because design is not only about the UX or the asp visual aspects, it's about the behaviors, it's about the ecosystem design. There is a practice of token design as well. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are not done with the research. We are finishing it. So if we have not spoken with you and you have insights, you have spoken to users, or you have any insight from your experiences, please come to 
talk to us, join the conversation, and let's build a freaking awesome experience for the world. Thank you.